you know, that's good to know. So, so I guess, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to do is learn about controlling physics of the fault system. That's what we really care about. How does a fault work? And that's what took us down this path, you know, using classical processing approaches. I was getting really frustrated a, dec a decade ago because I just felt like we were making no progress at all, you know, using precursors to failure and that sort of thing to try to understand the make the, how a fault works, especially near failure is interesting, but there were just no advances. And that's really what led us down this path. And that's the new data analysis toolbox that we'll be in, in, employing for the for the rest of this presentation. Wow. Okay, so hopefully we're okay. Nope. Sorry, it's your, it's your computer on mute. I mean, anyone else's computer on mute should put it on mute. Mine's on mute. Um, your speaker on mute, does not just your mic. Yeah, my speaker's on mute. Okay. Still? I don't hear it anymore. Now we're okay. If I hear it again, I'll Okay, okay. So apologies to all of you and anybody who might be listening online for that painful experience. Um, so, okay. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we'll start with sort of a historical summary of the work and, and what leads us up to today. So we'll start with laboratory and, and eventually simulation of laboratory experiments. And then we'll look at slow slip in, in faults in Cascadia. And we'll come back to current work, uh, including some work we did at Parkfield and then work we're currently doing elsewhere and back in the laboratory. So, doesn't want to advance. There we go. So, here's the basic question we're asking, okay? Um, and the question is, look, we're all familiar with looking at uh, waveforms, compressional, shear waves, surface waves, and what the vast amount of information we can learn from those waves about the source, about the path, et cetera. But the question we're asking is, is there information contained in the signal preceding the compressional wave and following the surface waves that might, that might be telling us about something about the fault system? Is there something being broadcast that we're just simply not seeing? Of course, we know there is to some degree because of low frequency earthquakes, tremor, et cetera, all this, information or all these waveforms and this phenom these phenomena have been discovered over the last two decades or so. So, so surely there's even more. That's, that was our thinking to begin with. So that's the point of departure, okay? So we're gonna go over this quick summary then, but we'll start with just a bit of background, right? Something that many of you are familiar with, but here's our shear experiment. Uh, so we're going to start with experimental data and move on from there. And this experiment is located at Penn State. Now it's Sapienza University as well. Chris Marone's lab. Chris has moved mostly to Sapienza in the last couple of years. But here's the experiment. You have three block system held in place with a horizontal load. You've got two fault zones just because of the symmetry of the experiment. And you've got fault gouge in this case. Often these are just glass beads, but you can use many different materials. You're recording this with acoustic transducers, accelerometer in this case, originally had an accelerometer located here. Now we have them located in the side blocks. Simultaneously to the stick slip behavior, this is either friction or shear stress as a function of experimental runtime. And so you see on the right, you know, sort of the lead-in period, this is time versus friction, the lead-in period where you get to an instability, eventually you start to see the stick slip behavior and then it gets fairly repetitive. And then you reach some sort of equilibrium out in here and, and the results start to look more like that. So that's the data set we're dealing with, that acoustic emission, but also think other things are measured like the gouge thickness, the displacement on the fault, the calculated friction because we know the horizontal load and we know the shear stress on, this, on the system 
et cetera. So there are many things measured in the mechanical system that we can use for targets or labels in a supervised learning approach. So here's what the input that, so I'm gonna jump right in. I don't wanna to give too much, I don't wanna show you the models we're developing in general. I just wanna show you the, the, the data and, the, and, and explain the approaches and the results, okay? If you're interested in the models that have been developed for these applications, they're in a series of papers that I can point you toward if you like. So the input data in this case, remember I pointed out we were recording either acceleration or velocity, now with many sensors, but originally with a single sensor. So this is dynamic strain amplitude as a function of experimental runtime. And you can see the associated stre shear stress on the fault here for two and a half stress cycles. So here's a laboratory earthquake. Here's the stress and friction buildup, instability and failure, classical precursors taking place in here. So, so what we're doing then is using this as our input data to some, some machine learning model. And our label or target is the shear stress. And we're asking ourselves at any given time window or instance, is there information contained in this signal telling us about what's happening with the shear stress or friction on the fault? So that's the first exercise. So that model you build to make that mapping from here to here is your your machine learning model, okay? That's f of x. So at the beginning, we were using simple models, decision tree approaches, if you're familiar at all with machine learning, random force, XG boost, um, primarily. Stop me if you have any questions, okay? Happy to answer questions along the way. So, so here again is our input data set. The, this is arbitrary unit sound of amplitude. This is experimental runtime. You can see large bursts of energy. Those are associated with uh, laboratory uh, earthquakes. And you can see on the right-hand side, the shear stress, again, is a function of experimental runtime. And you can see one of the time windows used in this exercise. This was, this was originally uh, just using uh, random forest. So you're running a moving window through here, as I mentioned, and trying to make the mapping for each moving window point in time to make the mapping to the shear stress. So you develop the model to do that. You, you validate the model, and then you test it on data it's never seen from the same experiment or from a different experiment. So that's the procedure you use in general for supervised learning. And on the right-hand side in red dash, faint in the background, you can see the actual measured shear stress on the fault. And the blue is the mapping made from the, strictly from the acoustic emission via the model to, to the shear stress. So you can see it does a remarkably good job. You know, it's not perfect. There's some deviation from it, but it's, 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 it's amazingly good that there's information contained at every instant of time in the acoustic emission regarding the state of the fault in terms of the shear stress. Yeah, question. That's good on the right hand side, that's for the test data. This is for the test data, right? Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Right. And another question? Yeah, so FFX is only taking that blue yellow stuff, taking the inputs plus that. It's taking, it's, it's a moving window. So at every, every window in time, you're making the mapping. You move the window, you make the mapping, and that's how you build the blue curve here. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah. Okay, just one more question. So you're, you're mapping the window to a single point? That's right. Ma mapping this, this short time window, this is an actual time window to a single point in shear stress space. Okay. Move the window, do it again. Move the window, do it again. Yes. The acoustic data is just one channel? In this case, it was one channel. We use multi-channel data now. So we have arrays of detectors now that we use, but this was the initial work where we used a, a single uh, detector. Effectively an amplitude of power in the... Uh... Effectively, it, it, was a, it was an accelerometer. So it was an actually acceleration as a function of time. Okay. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, the waveforms themselves may carry information how much your machine is using. It's like an interesting question. Yeah, right. That's right. We're going to get to why in a few moments, okay? Why this works. In fact, we might get to it in the next slide. Um, the other interesting thing is that, that you could learn something about the time to failure from the same approach. You could develop a model just to, to, to pose the question, how much time is it till the next failure event? Mm -hmm. And so that we did that. This was with Bertrand Rueil-Leduc and um, Claudia Aubert. Some of you know them. And so the idea is you map out just the time to failure based on the shear stress code. So every time there's a failure event, you just say there's a countdown to the next failure. And that's all this is. Time to failure is a, as a function of experimental runtime. And so you pose the question, can you develop a model to tell you when the next failure event might be? Well, that's the result. So this is a separate model, but also using a random forest as well. And you can see that the red dashed line is the countdown obtained strictly from this. And this is the mapping in blue that, that was obtained from the same kind of moving window analysis through the time train of the acoustic emission signal. So as soon as you had an event, uh, there's sort of a vector pointing down to the next time. It's a now forecast, which is to say, we only really know what's happening now. But as you go a few points in, you can see that you have a vector pointing to the next failure time, which is pretty remarkable. So it's not perfect. You can see it, it, doesn't, it doesn't always hit it, but you know approximately when it is. So, so it is a type of prediction, but it's a now prediction, and you're basing that real prediction on having a number of data points as a pointer to the next failure time. So not only now do we have information about the instantaneous shear stress, but also some idea of the next failure time. And you can develop models also to determine the current displacement, the friction, and and uh, the, the layer thickness, the gouge layer thickness, all of that was done and is contained in a, a, a couple, couple different papers. I won't show you all those because we want to move on to what we're currently doing. Sorry, this is just slow to move on. Hello. Okay. All right. So, so why? So what is the model finding that allows it to make this mapping? And so here's the answer to that question. So in the, the beauty of these decision tree approaches is you develop a feature space that is the model actually uses to make this mapping. And so it's, it's, it's the features of the raw data and the features for, for are the are statistical aspects of the signal, the mean, the median, the variance, the kurtosis, uh, and there are you can use hundreds of these features, and and the model can tell you which ones are important to make the mapping. And generally, it's not just one; it's a suite of these characteristics of the signal. And that's what I'm showing you here. The most important features for this this signal to make this mapping for both the time to failure and the shear stress for the variance of the signal, the kurtosis, and just an arbitrary threshold, okay, amplitude threshold. And you can see that there is this increase in the variance, kurtosis, and threshold amplitude as you approach failure. This is a failure event. This is a failure event. It drops and it repeats. And if you only used one of those statistical features, the mapping would be much, much less good. But if you're using many simultaneously, you, you get the kind of result I showed you, which is super robust. One of the great beauties of machine learning because it's using all these features and it's doing it in a, in a com fairly complex way that would be very hard to do by hand. And in fact, uh, you may not even have thought to look at these characteristics of the signal, so you didn't know they were there. 
we didn't know they were there. It was the model that told us they were there. And so, so this was, this was a, a period of exploration and discovery that was incredibly exciting. This was taking place in about 2017 when we were first being introduced to these kinds of results and realizing that this signal was just rich with information and contained a fingerprint of the characteristics of the fault at all times. So, okay, that was a very brief introduction to where we got started. And then the question was, all right, what about Earth? In the, in the laboratory, we've got this very simple fault system. You could think of it as a single frictional patch on a fault, whereas an actual fault has some extraordinarily large number of these uh, patches and they, they interact in some complex manner. So could you ever hope to succeed in, in, in applying this kind of approach to a real fault? Well, go, you know, ultimately we're interested in all kinds of slip, but we definitely want to learn about stick slip. But of course, the repeat time on most faults is very long. So we don't have training data sets. And we'll come back to that question or that point. But we do have things like slow slip where there are repeat times that are that are reasonable on a human time scale. Okay. Cascadia is a great example because the repeat time for slow slip in Cascadia is about 13 or so months. So we go through a very similar exercise, and I'll show you what, what this looks like in terms of the data. This is Vancouver Island. We're using seismic stations and GPS stations that are almost co-located. And we'll, I'm gonna show you results from a single seismic station and a single GPS station. And so the model input's gonna be continuous seismic data now instead of acoustic emission and propagated through from the fault through the, through the crust, right? So we've got, now we've got a long propagation distance in the laboratory, we're very close to the fault itself. So we have the complication of wave propagation paths. Um, the model output is gonna now be, rather than, than the shear stress or the displacement or the friction, it's gonna be the surface displacement from GPS, okay? So, so you're making the assumption, of course, that the movement on the surface of the earth is reflecting what's happening at depth, okay? Of course, there's an elastic medium between that, so there's a, a Green's function, uh, that you have to account for really, but all we're really doing is saying, okay, this is gonna, this is the GPS station is gonna reflect the displacement on the fault. And we're gonna ask if the seismic signal contains any information about the characteristics of the fault at all times. So it's the same general idea. And we started with um, decision tree approaches, random forest, next G boost. And, and then eventually we're using deep, deep learning. As many of you know, um, when you turn to deep learning, the problem is that you, don't, you can't back out what's going on in the model and getting at the characteristics it's identifying is really challenging. So it's a really, it's much more powerful in general, but it's much more opaque. So people like Laurent and people working on machine learning deep learning models and trying to untangle what's going on in them. This is a really important effort right now, but we're not there. So a great place to start is decision tree approaches because you can learn about what the model is doing. Turning to deep learning right away is really powerful, but maybe somewhat risky if you're interested in the physics. Okay. So I'm going straight to the result, all right? So we went through that same exercise, detected a single seismic station, a single GPS station. This is from the GPS station, BGC-5. This is displacement rate rather than strictly displacement. This is calendar date, 2012 to 2017. Missing data for this period of time. That's why you see nothing there. And the red, again, is the actual measured displacement from the GPS station. And the blue is the mapping the model is making. And you can see that it works. It looks like it's doing remarkably well. It's, it's capturing your average, at least average by eye, 
of the behavior of the GPS through multiple slip cycles. So each one of these is a, is a slip cycle, okay? So the upper plate every 13 months is lurching. There's subduction going. This is the North American plate and the Juan de Fuca plate. And every, um, every 13 months, the, uh, the upper plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, is lurching uh, seaward. And then it's carried back continental direction. And then 13 months later, it, it uh, slips backward. So, um, okay, so the surprising, really amazing thing to us at the time was this worked in Earth in a really complicated system. So, so beyond the laboratory and with a single seismic station and a single GPS station. So a lot of additional work has gone on to the, in, in the, on this problem, especially by Claudia Holbert and Bertrand Ruy Le Duc. And there are a number of papers out there that describe that work, but I won't go on with this. We're gonna continue on stepping towards seismogenic faults. So, you know, as you know, and as I mentioned, the re repeat time, fault friction as a function of time on, an, on earthquakes is very long on a human time scale, you know, roughly, let's say 30 to even a thousand years. So we don't have any training data sets except for small earthquakes. I'm talking about larger earthquakes here. We have small repeater earthquakes, for example, and we're going to turn to those in a moment. So we have essentially no tra training data for larger events. And what do we do? So what do we do is the remainder of this talk. We're using a variety of, of, of approaches to attack that problem. So let's start with what didn't work. Of Chris Johnson, who some of you know, uh, spent his first year of his postdoc. He arrived the week of the COVID shutdown at Los Alamos. It was miserable for him. Everybody in this room can relate to the misery of, of and loneliness of, uh, of that first year of COVID. Anyway, but uh, it was a time that he was very productive. So some of us can relate to that too, and other, others of us can relate to the fact we did nothing. But uh, um, so, so what, what we tried to do was, here, here's a very short description. Um, we were looking at repeater events, and what, what Chris tried to do was to actually uh, predict the time to failure. The surface displacement at, at uh, Parkfield, where we were working, has very little uh, displacement um, uh, me measurement. You, you don't see it in, in INSOR unless you measure over very long periods of time, average over a long period of time. There are creep measurements on other portions of the fault, which, which uh, we, we have to turn to still, but we were not using. We were using creep meters on the Hayward Fault north of here for repeating events too, but it failed, okay? Both, both decision tree approaches and deep learning failed. So it was, you know, it was demoralizing and it was uh, frustrating. And the conclusion we came to is they're just, the signal to noise ratio was such that these small events we're looking at, you know, magnitude two, threes um, for repeating events because repeating events tend to be quite small um, was such that the model was unable to tease this out and make the kind of mapping we were looking for this time to failure mapping. So, okay, what do you do next? So you, it's kind of back to the drawing board, right? So back to the drawing board means, okay, let's go back to the laboratory and let's start using simulation to train on. And that's where we're turning next here, okay? So, so we're going back to the laboratory knowing that's not our end goal here. Our end goal is the earth. So, but, but we're not there yet. And we'll talk about that when I wrap things up. But we're, we're gonna go back to the laboratory and simulation. And I'm gonna show you now what we're doing next. And I'm going to show you a, a series of approaches we're using simultaneously to attack this problem. So let's see. So, so we did pivot and work on a problem related to, to a, a deep learning approach to identify low frequency earthquakes. And that's the essence of this paper. But we do mention we failed in doing what we were set out to do. 
Okay, and if I can. Sorry, I don't know what happens, but anyway. All right, everything I just said is now repeated there, so let's move on. Okay, so work in progress. Um, so these are th sort of a three-pronged approach to instant, trying to predict the instantaneous characteristics like we did in the first experiment I showed you. Instantaneous characteristics being the friction, the, sh the shear stress, et cetera, rather than the future. So number one, train on earth, earth fault simulations. Well, train on laboratory fault simulations is what I'm gonna show you and test on actual faults, test on the laboratory fault. Can we make that work? Can we run simulations, train on that, train a model on that, apply it to a laboratory experiments? Can that work? And if that works, can we scale to Earth? Okay. Approach number one. Approach number two. <clears throat> so cross-train models use simulation and small quantity of laboratory data or Earth data to see if we can capitalize on using some of the data that exists maybe the only data that exists from a slipping fault. So I'm gonna show you that as well. So this is a step toward this. We wanna use as much information of the actual system that we can. And so that's the idea behind this portion. Then there's a third approach, really a second approach, because these are, these are combined, is using what's known as a, a PIM or physics of machine, uh, physics of informed machine learning where you incorporate some physics-based or empirical-based equation or equations to see if that can aid you in not only understanding what that equation might be telling you, but also can that help you with the prediction. So I'm gonna show you a bit of that as well. So, so this is, the, again, these are now predictions. These are not future predictions because these are, which wanna understand the workings of the fault in its current state. So, all right, so let's see. We're gonna start with using a deep learning approach. This is a kind of a classical encoder decoder. And we're going to, uh, we're going to tra train on, is that what I'm showing you? Yes, we're gonna train on data using a finite element plus discrete element approach that was developed by my colleagues at Los Alamos and a postdoc, <laughs> a postdoc working with us was using this for laboratory simulation. Interestingly, it wasn't the exper same experiment, the Monroe experiment he was simulating was a different experiment we were conducting. So we felt like we had very little chance of making this work. We thought we have these existing simulations, it's stick slip, let's try it. So that's what I'm gonna show you. So, so, the, so that's the first thing we did, training on simulations, testing on laboratory data. Here is, the simulation result. This is the equivalent of an acoustic emission. This is the absolute value of the kinetic energy of the system. Excuse me, it's the kinetic energy of the system as a function of runtime. So that, that's the, the conceptually the equivalent to acoustic emission. And this is the friction coefficient from the, the simulated system as a function of experimental runtime. And you can see this does not resemble the laboratory experiments, which were really periodic, well-behaved. This is much messier and much messier and probably much more like an actual system in Earth, for example. So this is the training data set where you take the kinetic energy, you try to map that to here. Can you make that work? And then can you take that train model and apply it to the laboratory data? So that's what I'm showing you next. Um, so here's the laboratory data. This is the normalized acoustic emission, right? So all, all we're doing is normalizing the acoustic emission signal now I've shown you many times. Here's the friction coefficient in this case. So I've, I'm, I'm, I'm intermixing shear stress and friction. Uh, so please be aware of that because we, we, we use both uh, variables to uh, map to. So, what, what we're trying to do then is we build, develop the model and then we want, to, we want to make this mapping. Okay, that's what I'm going to show you. So here is the, the uh, 
So the, here is a model train and tested only on lab data. So it's exactly what I've shown you before. So we're using acoustic emission of the lab, uh, laboratory data. This is now a deep learning model, that the encoder decoder model I just showed you. And you can see it does a really good job. It does a better job than the, the decision tree approaches do. But anyway, be that as it may, that's not what I wanna show you here. What I wanna show you is, this is a model trained only on simulations and then tested on the laboratory data. So I wanted to show you the comparison here, which is why I showed you this first. Again, I, I, I forgot to say the black is the measured friction on the experiment and the red is the mapping. Excuse me for, for not mentioning that here and here. So you can see that, you know, it's not very good, but it does capture the slip events. It doesn't capture the full magnitude. Um, and it seems to capture some of the sort of curving characteristics, the evolution of the shear stress as a function of time. But nobody would call that good. But nonetheless, it was surprising because the data were so different. And it was surprising because why would it make any mapping at all? Um, but, but hang on. So now you cross train that model. So you take the model you trained here and you retrain the latent space, the heart of the model with a portion of the laboratory data. Okay, in this case, it's six cycles for those of you who care and then you apply it again. And so you can see it does a much, much better job. It's still not as good as training and testing on the laboratory data. Yeah, Florent. The lab data being labeled here. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me just repeat that again. So you've taken this model that you train on simulation only and you, and you test it on laboratory data. Excuse me, you've tested on simulation data. You retrain that with a little bit of the laboratory data mm -hmm. with an eye on Earth, but ultimately you want to try something like this in Earth to see how well you do. So even with a model that I would say was not very good, it wasn't a good representation of the laboratory experiment we were running, it still worked remarkably well. Yeah, it missed the full magnitude of the slip events and, and not didn't capture all the characteristics, but nonetheless, it works surprisingly well. So it gives you hope that this kind of general approach could work in Earth. Yeah, question. So this <clears throat> last step where you uh, retrain the model on, um, on the lab data, um, are these latent weights, can they be used now to predict the simulated? Terms? You mean the same weights? Yeah, or, or is it like you're always to change them based on the shape? Right. Does it generalize? I think it's the question you're asking. If you applied it to a new data set or different kind of data set, could you apply the same model? Is that the question you're asking? Uh -huh. So, so, well, that's that's what we're trying to do here. Maybe, I, maybe, if maybe I either misunderstand your question or I didn't explain this well. Okay. So in this case, the model was trained strictly on simulations. We retrained just the latent space on several cycles of the earthquake data. Then we tested on other earthquake data the model had never seen, okay? So I don't know if that helped or not. Did I answer your question or no? Okay, okay. Other question? Yeah. Is there anything in the simulation that can explain why you are making the features? Yeah, I think the simple answer is sort of the distribution of the results in terms of slip characteristics in the simulation that overlaps with that of the experiment, but not perfectly. So you can Im imagine some sort of distribution, two distributions, there's overlap, but there's not a perfect match. And as a result, you're not making the map, mapping perfectly. So, so I, I, I hope that helps. And that's the way I view it, that the simulation could be much improved and we would do much better, which is to say that we could, we could match those distributions ultimately much, much better. Um, and that's something we will do.
But right now we're actually trying to choose, probably we'll do, we're trying to select the best path forward based on all of this work I'm showing you right now so that we're not wasting a lot of time going down dead ends, chasing dead ends. Um, uh, hi, Pyle. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question on previous slide? Yeah. Um, on the previous slide. So uh, the Let training... Get back to that. Yes, please. I'll try. I don't know why it doesn't want to easily move forward or backwards. Uh, it's okay. Go ahead, your, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so the middle plot, um, which is training, is done on simulation data. I assume simulation data should have should not have any noise or should be very clean. But the prediction seems to be much noisier than the first plot or second plot. Uh, can you elaborate why this is happening, or do you have any insights? Yeah, let me see if I can try to get back. There we go. So, so um, let me just say again, we're only training on uh, simulations and testing on the lab data here, right? To remind everybody what we're looking at. That's right. And uh, so why, the question is, why aren't we doing better, right? Is that the question? So the red plot seems very noisy. Uh, right. But, but given that it's kind of, uh, trained on simulation data, I was expecting to be kind of a smooth, so I'm not sure what's happening. So, so the black is laboratory data, right? It's trying to map to laboratory data, data it's never seen before. So it was trained to map to the simulation uh, stick slip data, frictional data. And so it's just not doing a very good job, okay? And that's because the simulations are not capturing all the characteristics of the laboratory stick slip behavior. So that's the simple answer. Beyond that, I think this is a deeper question that we could spend the next hour probably discussing. And there'd be a lot of ideas, I think, that would help us understand that. But that's the short answer, okay? Great, thank you. Other Welcome. Other question back there? Wait, 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 one more back here. Uh, I just wanted to know what is the intuition behind keeping the weight constant and then holding the and changing the model? Why, why, why do you want to train the model over the Train the model on simulation data and apply it to the laboratory data? Yeah, what, what, what's the intuition behind changing the model? Okay, so, so the intuition was, can we make the model more robust by retraining the latent space with actual data that we're interested in predicting, which is to say laboratory data or earth data. So let's take advantage of the data we actually have to see if it can help us get to our goal, which is to predict the instantaneous behavior of an actual fault in earth. Does that answer your question? So I guess you want to make it more sensitive. We, 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 want, to, we want to make it the model more powerful predictor of the current behavior of the fault. That's what we want to do. And it turns out we can do we can we can use the information from the actual system we're interested in predicting in the model in the latent space of the model to help us get there. Okay. And one other question. Yeah, can you, can you just repeat what the model did for here? This is the energy. Yeah. So 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 for this um, for for the center one, the model was trained on kinetic energy from the simulation and, and you're predicting the friction that the simulation has predicted as well, has given you, okay? And then for the, uh, and then you take that and you apply it to that model that you train, you apply it to um, the laboratory data and this is what you get. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And what are the actual measurements they take in the laboratory experiments? Again, it's the acoustic emission and the measurement of the friction. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So these are uncontrolled temperatures, uncontrolled humidities, uncontrolled, and all everything I'm showing you today. You can do that, but we weren't doing that, and it turns out we didn't need to um, because well, you can see the results speak for themselves. 
especially when you're training and testing just on the laboratory data. But anyway, it's on uncontrolled conditions. And the material? Uh, steel blocks are used for the, uh, for the fault blocks. And in this case, glass beads are the fault gouge. Again, you can use other materials. We have used other materials, granite blocks, um, um, ground up quartz, uh, uh, um, clays, et cetera, for fault gouge, many other things. But what I'm showing you are, are those materials, okay? Anything else before we move on? Yeah, as I have a question about the of training the latent space, um, you mentioned that you have to have a Play with the data, for example, mixing the simulation data and the uh, lab data and time together or using some mm -hmm. ensemble model. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, 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 you're right. There are many other things you could do. And I think our, our, uh, our philosophy right now is let's test some fundamental ideas that we think have promise. And then let's pursue the one or ones that have, hold the most promise. So, yes. Uh, you could do exactly what you're saying and spend spend a lot of effort and maybe make really good progress doing something like that or 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 a group of things like that, but we haven't done it. Okay, that may come depending on the outcome of everything I'm showing you today. Okay, so let let me move ahead and and for the moment save some of your questions because we're getting to the end of the presentation time and I'm going to run out of time. I'll get as far as I can though. And sorry, again, for some reason, this does not want to advance. There we go. So just to say uh, with an eye on earth, what we did next was to train the latent space again, not on multiple cycles of the laboratory data. So this is the train model from simulation, but we just trained it on a portion of a slip cycle. So this is a long slip cycle, and you can see there's a large precursor in here and several others. But we just trained on this portion of the laboratory cycle, thinking, okay, maybe that's a 30-year period of, a, of an existing fault of data that we might actually have access to that we could retrain the latent space with. So using, rather than multiple cycles, just one, because that's all we would have in Earth, what happens? And here's what happens. So. So let's focus on this post failure, this one. You can see that when you train with less data from in the late, the, we train the latent space with less data, you don't do as well as you did previously when you used multiple cycles. But nonetheless, it's showing some promise. So that tells us that, okay, we can, there are many things we could do, including and primarily improving the simulations going to Earth. Um, but that we can also use Earth data, portions of realistic portions of Earth data to retrain the latent space. So that's a direction we're currently still going in, but let me get to the other approaches we're using before I run out of time. How about that? And uh, let's do, if you would please withhold your questions till the end so we can get through it all. So let's talk about, I mentioned uh, using actual physics in the uh, deep learning model. Um, this is often called physics of informed machine learning. I mentioned it a little while ago. And I'll simply say that we're using a deep learning model. We're, we're incorporating in something many of you are familiar with, rate state friction, which is the go-to frictional model for faulting, whether you like it or not. And you may not like it. I don't really care for it because it's an empirical, it's, it's a curve fitting law that tells you about the activity on a fault. It's very powerful, but there's no physics in it. Okay, nonetheless, I digress and I give you my own opinion. You may disagree. But so, so the model predicts the friction on the fault. It has two branches, but it simultaneously predicts the rate state characteristics, the, the, uh, the A, the B, the D sub C characteristics that many or many of you are familiar with in, in, in the rate state model. And then it predicts independently the friction on the fault. So you have two predictions. 
One is the character, the, these, these variables in rate state that, that you can back out friction through the model from, and the friction just from the deep learning model. And you combine those, sum those for a total loss function, if you're a mean absolute error in this case, calculate the gradients, update your weights as you typically do, um, perform for all batches, go through your validation, check early stopping, repeat till you're done, okay? So this is the sort of the systematics behind what we're doing right now. This is looking really good, actually. We haven't published this yet, but um, it's looking really promising. We're right, you know, laboratory once laboratory data once again. The um, we have a training, validation, and testing data set here, just to show you that they're independent from each other. And this is what you get out of sort of the preliminary tests we've done. But look at the top panel where you see the friction as a function of experimental runtime. The, the black is the measured friction on the experiment once again. And the, um, the red is the rate state friction at one branch of the model. The blue is the neural network uh, out friction from the model. So, so they're both doing pretty well. And when they're combined, they do re remarkably well. So, so that's another general approach that we're exploring in terms of bringing in the physics or in, in, let's, let's say the, the empirical based law to see if it can help us improve the model to ultimately apply in Earth. So that's why we're doing it, and that's the direction we're going. Stay tuned for this because this is work in progress, and we don't know yet where it's going to lead. But this is sort of this is one of the states of the art in machine learning, you know. So so many people are applying this general approach to in hopes of teasing out physics or including physics to help solve their problem. Ultimately, we'd like to develop our own frictional model using this kind of approach, but that's a tangent. Um, these are some of the rate state characteristics. For example, that's D sub C. So you're actually predicting D sub C and these other characteristics, things you've never even you never even knew about throughout the stress cycle. That's that's quite interesting in itself, but that's also a that's a talk in itself. So let's move on. So okay, right. Prediction is based on timing, magnitude, and location, right? And, and as I think everyone in this room knows, there's never existed a reliable approach to prediction. And let's look at Benno Gutenberg, who was at Caltech, one of the great names in, in geophysics in the last century. This is in response to Mr. Herman Saylor, who apparently was asking him about earthquake prediction in 1947. This laboratory does not predict earthquakes. Specific predictions giving time and place come from amateurs, publicity seekers, believers in the occult, or just plain fools. Okay, Los Angeles remains exposed to the risk of a great earthquake, which may take place at any time. Yours truly, <laughs> Benno Gutenberg. This is such a beautiful letter. And so I want, I want to make it really clear, we're not out to predict earthquakes. And we're out to predict the instantaneous characteristics of a slipping fault. We think we can make progress on predicting the timing of an earthquake. And I've, sh I've shown you hints of that in, in some of the work we've done. And there may be time to show you one more piece of that. But getting the magnitude and the location, wow, this is a huge challenge period. So, so just to make it really clear, because we've been ac accused of thinking we can predict earthquakes by well-known people and it hurts, it kind of stings. And maybe it's our own fault or my fault because maybe I was misrepresenting in it, in, in, unintentionally about what we were trying to do. So I don't make that clear to you. We're not predicting earthquakes. Okay, so so other things we're, we're doing, how much time do I have, if any? Yeah, time. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm really almost done but I wanna show you uh, one or two other things we're working on as well to give you a flavor of sort of the spectrum of work the group, group is conducting. So, so we also, we're also working on near future prediction 
specifically of friction. It wouldn't have to be friction. And this is laboratory experiments again. It could be default displacement or some other characteristic, but that's what I'm gonna show you today. We're using natural language processing, which is also quite current for, uh, you know, it was developed for, for natural languages. You know, your iPhone, for example, filling in annoying text in the future when you're trying to type a message to somebody. It's that kind of thinking, right? A model that does that, that can fill in the future behavior of the fault. And so conceptually, that's what we're trying to do with the natural language processing. So I'm gonna show you one slide of that. And then I wanna show you actual work we're doing with seismic data in Earth. So I'm just showing that because I haven't shown you any models uh, ex except actually the, the informed machine learning, which was a cartoon model. This is just a cartoon of the approach we're using to predict using natural language processing in the near future. Um, you know, you're using natural language processing with attention heads, as they're called. Some of you are quite familiar with that, Florent and others, and trying to see if we can predict the future of friction on the fault and how far into the future if we can. So we're going to do that next. So the same data sets, we're the same old laboratory experiment. You're probably getting really tired of looking at this experiment but it's allowed us to, get, to sort of make the kind of progress we've made. So, so this is the, the absolute value of, of the scaled normalized acoustic emission, same old experiment, stick slip behavior. And this is the, this is the, uh, the natural language appro approach, which is a convolutional encoder decoder. It says on top with a transformer model with attention heads. Uh, for, for those of you that are involved in machine learning. So for the rest of you, just, you know, you can disregard that. But here is the prediction. So what you're doing is you're taking a portion of the time series signal, the acoustic emission, you're saying, what is the future friction on the fault? Can you tell me what the future friction is? And that's what the red line is here, okay? So, 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 so you're asking, you're asking yourself at this time, what is the friction at this time? And it works. It works modestly well. It's not perfect, but at any given time, the, these, these seismic wave or acoustic emission can, has, has some sort of ability or some sort of information in it that tells you, I know what the next friction step is going to be. If I go far out in time, for example, to the next slip cycle, far into the next slip cycle, it fails. So the closer you are in time, the better it does in general, kind of what you'd expect if it would work at all. So um, that's the essence of some work that was just completed. And you can see that actually, it was just published this, uh, this week in GRL if you're interested. Um, I'm not gonna say more about that because I just wanna get through this and we'll come back to questions. So this is work with uh, Stefan Nielsen's group. Some of you might know Stefan at Durham University in UK and a student of his, Veda Ong, a master student, uh, worked on this problem of trying to predict failure time on actual faults using seismic data from Japan. So using a single station, multiple events all over magnitude six, something like 30 events to train on. And you're using a classification procedure and you're doing something very arbitrary. You're saying that, okay, at a certain amount of time before an earthquake takes place, past earthquakes, or your training data set, I'm gonna call everything preceding that noise. Everything following that, I'm gonna call a precursor, okay? I mean, we know there are these classical precursors uh, preceding failure in general. So, so it's logical, but the fact that you're just doing this arbitrarily is, is maybe uh, a little bit distasteful, but let's try it anyway, that's the idea, okay? Because the closer you are to the rupture time, the larger the amplitude and the more intense these precursors become. So there is some logic to it. So I'm just showing you preliminary results. 
This is time prior to the start of an earthquake. This is what the classification model that was developed. It's a deep learning model. I'm not going to talk about the characteristics. So this is the fraction of precursors, and you can see that the you know at 10 hours up to three and a half hours before this sequence of earthquakes that were tested on, uh, the models classifying it as noise, but then begins to classify the signal as precursor, and that increases in intensity as you, as you move to failure, which is completely logical. So actually, I think this is a very hopeful direction to go, and we are going in this direction to do a much larger study, both in various regions, Japan, where you have the best data in the world, but also in Alaska, uh, potentially Chile, New Zealand, et cetera, and eventually do a global study. So that's where this work is going. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure at this point, you're, you're probably a little bit um, overwhelmed, most of you, and I apologize for that. But I think what I wanted to show you is these many directions that our group is going into, our, that we're going, and to encourage you, any of you that are interested in this area to, to take the lead and do something similar or go in a new direction or to apply this, this group of tools to whatever you're doing, as I said at the beginning. And it's up to you young people to really drive this because guys my age uh, and people actually that are you know 40 and older, they're not gonna do that. They're too busy, they're, they're, we're set in our ways. And um, it, it's really up to mostly the young people to learn this stuff at a young age and then just incorporate it into your daily work. You know, you don't do machine learning to do machine learning. You do machine learning to help you solve problems. Okay. So anyway, so the noise is the signal. This is what we've discovered. What we thought was noise pre pre previous to all this work turns out to be a very rich signal coming out of this fault system that's telling us about the behavior at all times. And we believe that's also uh, taking place in Earth based on the work that we, that we had done with slow slip. But also we believe that seismogenic faults sticks, that stick slip are doing the same thing. And the question is, can we prove that or disprove that? Thanks so much for your attention.